So this here is Akiba's Trip Hellbound and Debrief for the PlayStation 4, a port of the PSP game Akiba's Trip Plus with updated graphics. The Akiba series is definitely a bit of a weird one, a family of games whose sole defining characteristic is the celebration, exploration, and representation of subcultures within Japan's electric city of Akihabara. Not counting mobile games, there's only three entries in this franchise, and those three entries are split between two sub-series. We have the two Akiba's Trip games, strip-driven brawlers which focus on the anime, cosplay, and more sexually indulgent or exploitive side of Akihabara, and we have the One Akiba's Beat Game, which is an action RPG similar to the Tales of franchise, which tends to focus on the music and idol culture of Akihabara. The two trip games were made on especially small budgets and established a cult following thanks to their celebration of otaku culture, and of course the downright zany stories and gameplay ideas. Given the budget, however, obviously a lot of these things were never firing on all cylinders, so the series maintains a reputation for its somewhat staggering levels of jankiness. In my unboxing video for the 10th anniversary set, I made the following remark. Tear into the original entry of a cult classic series resurrected with all new HD graphics. I hope they didn't resurrect it with all new HD gameplay because I'm really looking forward to the jank. To a degree, I stand by this. I tend to enjoy a bit of jank in my games, that's no secret. But I also find myself reminded of the age-old warning to be careful what you wish for. Now I do remember when Undead and Undressed came out talking to a friend about how janky it was, and he seemed happy that I had fun with this game regardless, but he proceeded then to tell me how janky Hellbound and Debriefed was. I definitely understand where he was coming from now, and I really can't say that he was over-exaggerating anything. Akiba's Trip Hellbound and Debriefed is a really janky game that rides a really close line and unfortunately tips into bad jank a little more frequently than it tips into good jank. But before we get too deep into that, Let's get into the story. First experiences, right? Mm, they stick with you. Like when I cleared my first girl on an H game. Akiba's trip begins without hesitation. Our main character is beaten down in a dark alley close to death, when a female vampire bites her lip and feeds him some of her blood to stave off his dying. Before she can see him recover, however, a group arrives on scene. She flees at their sight, and the group takes his body out of the alley and into an interrogation room. Upon awaking, he's told he's become a vampire, and he's given an opportunity. They explain how vampires are the enemies of Akiba. Akihabara, growing in numbers each day, converting the citizens of the Electric City and forcing them out of the sunlight and into lives as shut-ins. As such, they are a force that needs to be dealt with. If we wish to survive the rising sun, we must agree to work with the agency as a vampire and help battle the growing vampiric threat. And we really are forced. If you disagree here, the sun will indeed come up, fry your corpse, and force you to restart the game. It's kinda rad, I, I rather dig it. So of course we agree. From there, you're thrown into the Freedom Fighters of Akihabara, where from their main base in the heart of the city, we await and follow the agency's orders. Along the way, we meet various new characters and explore different ways of life within the otaku culture of Akihabara, and the game slowly weaves a narrative of social acceptance and diversity in the face of mega corporations and the new age sensibilities that have been slowly phasing out some of the subcultures of the city. We see through the locally used social networking app Pitter as well that folks have been noticing Akihabara gradually losing its identity, as more and more more mega corporations buy shops within the town and push the mom and pop shops that the area was built upon out of the picture along with their faithful clientele. Against this backdrop, the vampires, as they're presented by the agency, share something of a duality with the mega corporations, representing the same nefarious and gradual overtake of the city that quite literally removes its citizens from the street. Though I can almost guarantee that was never the intent. That's just me seeing what else the vampires could possibly represent, as vampires and media are ever rarely just that. Typically, they are chosen as villains because they represent a sort of parasitical threat that operates from within the shadows, creating change so gradual that people don't realize what's happened until they're fully immersed in the devastation of it. So basically, Walmarts across America versus all the fun, interesting small stores that used to exist before they took everything over and pushed them out of business. <laughs> The characters we get to spend our time with are exaggerations at the best, but often in the best of ways. They're mostly played for comedic effect, but they can break character pretty well when it's time to do or say something serious. There's a lot of reference to what was current discourse at the time as well, and for those that weren't around for it, it might fly over your heads, but the longer you've been involved with anime, the more these things might pay off. 
There's one conversation in here where a group of people passionately discuss how Moe has overtaken anime. A conversation I remember happening a lot back around 2006 or so, and I was just blasted to be reminded of it again, as if reliving a part of my past I had forgot. To say that that was a divisive time for anime fans would be an understatement. If you think there's vitriol in the community now, you should have seen things then. Overall, I don't have much issues with the plot or characters. It's not meant to be taken seriously, but there are a few moments that can be somewhat endearing or downright hilarious, and that's really more than I was ever asking for. The objectives when progressing the game, however, I do have some issue with. More than once, I found myself with nary a clue as to how to progress, and the game's supplied to-do list offered very little to alleviate my suffering. At one point, I found myself stuck for over two hours. I had completed every side quest available, and I was becoming more and more sure with each passing minute that I had maybe locked myself out of progressing. It was actually considerably frustrating. The answer ended up being something pretty simple, as they usually are in times like this, but with no reason to ever consider the answer until all other options had been exhausted, I was left feeling that the game needed to do more to provide direction. Considering it only took me 13 and a half hours to complete my first playthrough, which I landed on the true ending of, being stuck for what was essentially nearly 15% of the total runtime on this one hang-up was not cool. There were other places I felt this lack of direction issue too, but that was by far the worst. Generally though, things are pretty smooth sailing. I completed to the main route in about three sittings and never had to stop due to the mounting frustrations. And even when stuck, the game offers a lot of side quests, mini games, unlockables, upgrades, and special challenges to bide your time with. Some of these challenges are pretty awful though, like the strip Jonkin matches that give you game over if you lose. But hey, it's always nice to change the pace if you desire. Given there are several routes in the game, replays are also heavily encouraged. And new game plus mode will carry over some of your character stats and items, as well as unlock new character models to play as and even unlock a new extra hard otaku difficulty mode. There are four difficulty modes to choose from, three of which are available from the beginning. And for anybody who is willing and for anybody who will be playing, these are named kinda like shit. You have Easy, Casual, and Gamer. As most of you know, I play most of my games on standard difficulty for the purpose of review. Given how these were named, I assumed that means Casual is standard. Though because of its name, I initially started my playthrough on Gamer. After a warning from people in my Discord who are smarter and more experienced than me, link in the description, I dropped the game down to Casual Mode this game's normal. Apparently gamer mode is a bit of a grind fest, and from what I discovered early on, enemies on the street are obnoxiously aggressive straight from the get-go. So unless you're looking to suffer, maybe don't do your first playthrough on gamer. You cannot change difficulty settings mid-play without majorly setting yourself back. And I mean setting yourself back to the very beginning, but keeping some of your gear. And now we get to the fun stuff. This is where we look at the game's really unique design and exceptional lack of polish. Let's talk about the combat. So given this is the title that eventually birthed the sequel, Undead and Undressed, if you played that game, you'll find the combat here is very similar, only less refined. And yes, I'm fully aware Undead and Undressed was already pretty unrefined. If Undressed was a burning pool of gas that somebody pissed in, then Hellbound is a burning pool of diesel that many people pissed in. It's pretty rough. So at its core, the ideas are here, and on paper, they're fine. You have three main attack buttons, right? X, square, and triangle. Coinciding with your position on the controller, they attack at different heights and therefore different parts of the body, those being the legs, the torso, and the head. Whether or not you hit when you attack can sometimes feel like a matter of RNG, as if playing rock, paper, scissors against the enemy's dodge ability. The further into the game you get, the more likely they are to evade your attack, but it's not too big of an issue. The goal here isn't to drain your enemy's HP, but to damage their clothing enough to strip them, causing vampires to burn up on the spot and regular humans to run into hiding. To strip an article of clothing, you must hold down the button that corresponds to the piece you are trying to remove after the game informs you it's damaged enough. If you hold the button prior to dealing enough damage, you can still try to strip them, but it'll be a button matching challenge you're quite likely to lose. Similar to your enemies, game over also depends on whether or not you can keep your clothes on. To help out with this, there is a full suite of clothing and weapon equips that deal different levels of damage or have different levels of durability, which you can upgrade using gathered materials throughout the game. You can also use curatives to temporarily boost these same stats while 
without exploring. Clothing and weapons can only be changed from the game's map screen, which isn't a decision I fully support, but I get it. This ensures that you can't just swap to a clean pair of clothes between rounds while fighting in any given area, and it does to a degree help maintain the game's level of challenge, adding more of an endurance match quality to ongoing fights. And in case it wasn't clear, you only access the map screen when you leave an area. When your clothing is damaged, if you can escape your attackers long enough, you can put your weapon away with L1 to straighten them back out and restore some of their durability. Though this, like everything, is pretty cumbersome. As you level up, you unlock some new moves, and let me just say, these hardly work worth a damn, but are at least conceptually neat and fun ideas. The more powerful ones state that you need to press L1, R1, and a face button all at the same time to use. However, if you risk at all pressing L1 first, you'll find yourself just putting away your weapon. If you hit a face button first, you'll just launch a normal attack. R1, which doubles as your dodge button, should by all accounts be held down first. It's the most surefire way I found to make these moves actually work, but it only barely works, and they take so long to activate that they usually get interrupted anyway. Other moves that say that they just require a direction and a face button, I'm still relatively lost on. They mostly seem to trigger at random for me, and barely ever when I mean them to. Most of your moves otherwise, and your abilities to strip clothes from different types of people, and your combo extenders are actually purchased in the form of ebooks at the various shops throughout Akihabara, with each weapon type requiring a different book. One on one, the fights aren't the worst thing in the world. Janky, yeah, a little unresponsive, messy, and a bad camera, but you can generally navigate them. It's when you have to deal with large crowds where fighting completely falls on its face. So you know how in a lot of other games when you have to fight a large crowd of enemies, most of them will kind of keep their distance and engage you one at a time? Well, in this, they all just close in at once and beat you relentlessly. Often, from the point of the first strike, you end up stun locked and unable to break out without getting extremely lucky. And it can be very frustrating. But the frustrations don't stop there. There's something of a world affinity system at play that early on can really impede your ability to make progress. Depending on how many times you've attacked the Shadow Souls, the names of the vampires in this game, or innocent civilians, you'll have different groups of people start attacking you on site as you simply walk around town. If the police see you in a fight, this will generally lead to an arrest, as the police are some of the hardest enemies to take down in the game. Once arrested, a fine will follow, which I found became more and more expensive every time I got arrested. Where money is sometimes required to progress and you can actually go into a negative dollar amount this way, this is yet another source of frustration. Though I will say you can form a cute little relationship with the officer that you pay your bail to on the way out, and the conversations you have with her each time you get arrested are fun and somewhat endearing. But that that's about it for combat. It's not exactly deep, though they did try to add some depth to it. Sadly, the controls for the deeper combat feel rather busted, as does the detection at times. The inputs, the stun locks, and the accuracy of your attacks also don't pan out the way you would like. Now, I like the unique sensibilities this combat was built around, and the goofy special attacks like the Kamehameha, and the anime figure you can basically hypnotize the weeaboos with, but none of it works well enough to be passable, so yeah, careful what you wish for, I guess. I'm really looking forward to the jank. And the last thing I want to look at is the performance and technical aspects. And I mean, don't expect too much. It is a PSP game. Starting with the visuals, obviously it's not great. Do I mind though? No, not really. I kind of like the budget aesthetic. If you're somebody who's picking this up for the fan service side of things, the low poly models may be a bit of an issue for you, unless you happen to just like square butts, in which case this is the best thing since SpongeBob. But the game's not really all that lewd, despite the content anyway. The 2D portraits are a mixed bag. Some of them look all right, and I like how sketchy they are in general. Though some haven't survived the upresing process too well and show a lot of random white edges and pixels that should have been cleaned up. Up. The interface and text boxes are very PSP, but I dig it. The frame rate is fine where I'm playing this PS4 game on PS5. Though I did hear on Switch, in areas where there are heavy amounts of NPCs, the game can slow down quite a bit. Sound effects are, like the game itself, mostly budget, as if most of them were taken from a free sound effects website. The voiceovers? Again, they're mixed. There's undeniably some good voice work here and there, and also some not so great voice work, but the biggest issue is by far the consistency of the recording. There's a lot of lines, especially early on, that stick out as if they've been recorded at home or off an iPhone, and this is among many other voices that sound pretty professionally recorded. Oh, Rui. 
are you doing here? Let the human go. Ah, seriously? The hell are you talking about? Have you not fed enough this week? There's no need to- This does tend to get better as it goes with only rare lines here and there sticking out later on. The default sound balance in the game though is absolutely horrendous and buries most of the dialogue in the music. So if you do play this, remember to dial the music and some of the sound effects down a fair bit before starting. Most games have an issue in this regard, but not quite to this extent. They're sucking the life force out of this country day by day. They even have a name for it. The Annoyingly too, there's an anime cutscene late into the game with a live band playing, but no subtitles are provided for the lyrics. And I would like to know what they were saying here, I feel like it's probably somewhat relevant. Now we already covered most of the control issues I had earlier, though I'd like to add one more here. It's just a tad annoying that fast forwarding dialogue you've maybe seen before is done with a square button, but fast forward in the live posts on Pitter is done with X. There's no reason they couldn't be consistent with this. There's also no auto text progression, which is always a minor annoyance or oversight for me. But that about wraps it up, so what can you really say about this in closing? Well, if Undead and Undressed was a 6 to 6.5 at best, then Hellbound and Debriefed is probably like a 5, and that might be being a little generous. Both games are equally as memorable, though Hellbound is much more of a chore to get through. I love the social aspects and all the hidden content, I like the story and the zany combat ideas, and I like the characters, but the overall execution is really hurting. This is a game that's sure to frustrate, bewilder, and possibly even anger some of the more patient players. Players. However, I do not regret my playthrough, and I'm sure I'll remember the journey fondly in years to come. But the thought of playing it again stirs no desire in me, nor does the thought of recommending others to play it, as playing it really is a bit too much of a shit show this time. Though if you look at all of this and think to yourself that this might be something you might enjoy anyway, then yeah, sure, I'm not gonna stop you from picking it up. There are worse things out there, and there are things that just don't leave any impression one way or another. And over those, I would take this game any day. But yeah, this isn't a game that I would put anywhere towards the top of your 2 playlist, or even anywhere towards the bottom of your 2 playlist. Uh, just keep it a little bit outside of that. But if you are one of those people and you are interested, Maybe also check out my unboxing video, it should be up in the card here, here, maybe here. It should be in a card somewhere, but that's where I'm going to leave it today. If you guys like the video or found it useful at all, you know the deal. Like, comment, subscribe, and share the video if you can. Links to all of my socials and my Patreon support page are in the description below, and as always folks, thanks for watching. Now. I get to change shirts and pretend that the next video, or the last one, depending on what order I upload them in, was filmed on a different day. And it looks like Scarlet Nexus. Much overdue. Much overdue. Both videos are just about done. These are the last parts I gotta do, so see you guys there.